week two in our study in the book of Psalms, chapter 91. And the series is entitled Faith Over Fear. Now, I, we, we talked a little bit about it last week, but it's so easy for us to feel fear in this day and age. You, you don't just turn on TV, but you turn on Christian radio. You can turn on anything and everything, and you're going to feel some fear because it's just so prevalent. And being honest, it's just so real in this day and age what we see out there. And 1 Peter 5 eight, Peter is writing, and he says this, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around, listen to this word, like a roaring lion. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. The devil's trying to feed you fear. He's prowling around like a roaring lion, trying to feed you with, if, if the election goes this way or it goes this way, whatever way it goes, it's going to be horrible. Like it's going to be death for you. That's the enemy roaring around like a roaring lion. If your kids can't go to school, it's going to be horrible for you. Or if your kids can't go to school, whatever it is, whatever it is, you're going to feel some fear on this side right now because the devil is roaring around like a roaring lion. For the fun of it, I don't have it on the screen, but I want to read to you that same passage in the message. It's really good. Keep a cool head. Hard to do that sometimes. Especially when you're driving in traffic. <laughs> Stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. Keep your guard up. That doesn't mean work harder. That means keep your guard up on knowing that Jesus loves you. You're not the ones, or you're not the only ones plunged into hard times. It's the same with Christians all over the world. Right? We're all experiencing a virus right now. We're all experiencing hardship right now. So keep a firm grip on your faith. The sufferings won't last forever. It won't be long before this generous God, who has great plans for us in Christ, eternal and glorious plans that they are, will have you put together on your feet for good. He gets the last word. Amen. Yes, he does. Amen. Right? So the devil's rolling around trying to get you to fear and trying to get you to doubt and trying to get you to question God and His promises and His love for you because you're basing His love for you on how you act. You're basing His love for you on how you perform. And that's not what Jesus did. Jesus died on the cross so we don't have to base it on that. So the devil's trying to get you to fear. He's trying to get you to doubt. But Jesus has given us some weapons. And Paul addresses them. We read it last week. Quickly, though, in Ephesians chapter 6, it says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. So your weapon can be, not this physical Bible, although if I hit Matt I'm hard enough, <laughs> I could hurt him with this Bible because this is a thick Bible. So you, th th this is actually useless unless it has the Spirit of God behind it. Amen. And that's what's alive on the inside of you. So this is your weapon. That's why we're studying Psalms 91. So we can understand our weapon and use it. Now, I, I'm not the greatest construction person. I'll be honest with you. I don't... A lot of stuff around our house doesn't get done because I'm not a very good construction person. And Angie's dad is. And so I usually just call him. Hey, come over for dinner. <laughs> dinner. So I'm not the greatest person to do construction. And I have a lot of tools. But I don't know what they do. <laughs> and so I don't use them well. We've yeah. done some things around here that I've hacked and not done great, but Matt brings this off, Matthew brings this awesome tool to like pry stuff off and it would have made our job so much easier, but I didn't know how to use it. And so I never used it. It's the same thing with the Bible. If we don't use it correctly, we don't know how to use it, it can be a whole lot more beneficial if we know how to use it. So that's why we come to church, that's why we get together in communities and study the Word of God, is because we believe it is our weapon, and it is life transforming. So, Psalms 91, if you haven't opened up your Bibles, or opened up your phones on your app, Psalms 91, we're going to read it all the way through. Now let me preface this a little bit. I'm going to read you the New Living Translation. So if you don't know, there's lots of different translations of the Bible that say things differently. It's all the same spirit-driven um, inspired Word of God, but different translations help you understand it in different ways. So we're going to read it all the way through in the NLT. But when we break it down today, we're going to read it out of the New King James. And the New King James is an older version 
of the Bible. But it's helpful. It kind of expands on some words sometimes. But when you're reading in big chunks, it's easier to read the NLT. Simple enough? Okay, let's read it. I don't have my Bible open, so let's just go here. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. Remember we talked about declaring it and, and speaking out of our mouth. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust in Him. We broke down those two verses last week. You can listen to it. Go on our YouTube channel if you want. For He will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly diseases. He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armor and your protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrows that fly in the day. Do not dread the diseases that stalks in the darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand may fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. Verse 9. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you, no plague will come near your home. For He will order His angels, being Jesus, to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Verse 13. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. And finally, when they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with long life and give them my salvation. Psalms 91 is a prayer that you can pray over you and your family. Father, I just thank you that as we dive into this a little bit today, that you would speak to us. You would help us to feel faith and not fear. And trust in you when we do feel fear. And lean on you. And claim these for our lives in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 I need a little bit of help, not from you, but from the guys back there of um, what my title is today. So go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more than feeling. Okay, that's all I'm gonna put you to. So, um, everybody know that song? Yeah. Right? Does anybody know who it is? I googled it like four times and I just forgot. So, it's a no name guy. So, I'm just gonna give somebody an extra point, Matthew. Okay. Do you know the song? It's before my time, but yes. It was 1974. Yeah, is that before your time? That's zero. Oh, that's zero. Feelings. They debated just titling it feelings, but that song was way more fun than just titling it feelings. So we all have them, and I think a lot of times, I know I do, I live by my feelings. You know, I, I, I feel like eating ice cream instead of dinner. I, I, I feel like eating chips and pop, which I do often. It's not healthy, but we do it sometimes. What Do you live by your feelings? If we live by our feelings... Man, I think each and every one of us, it goes without saying, we would be in a world of hurt. Or there's been times where we have lived by our feelings, and it's left us down a road that is not helpful. Angie and I never felt, I mean this with all sincerity, Angie and I never felt like planting a church. We never wanted to plant a church. If we lived by that, we wouldn't be here today, and we wouldn't be seeing the transformation in the lives that we're seeing, and the good things Amen. that God is doing through us, and we... Uh, we and it's just so great that, that God is proving himself through what we didn't feel Amen. like doing. Yeah. I think all of us can attest that we don't feel like making the right choice sometimes. Ice cream is way better than vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> way better. Candy is way better than fruit. Now, maybe if you love fruit more than candy, then you're better than me. <laughs> Your feelings will lie and they will bring you down a, a, a road of destructions. And, and we see that all over our world. We see that all through Scripture. People don't feel like trusting God. And they don't feel like going the way. But some, some do. And it turns out good for them. We're going to look at Gideon a little bit later today. And he doesn't feel like he's a mighty man of valor. But Jesus says otherwise to him. Verse 3 of Psalms 91 says this. Surely 
He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from perilous pestilence. So that's the New King James Version. Surely, now we talked a little bit about it last week, but the writer of Psalms is either David or Moses most likely. And so they're not praying these hopeful, wishful prayers of Psalms 91. He's praying absolutes that these are the God that I know and that I've served. I look back at the lion and the bear and Goliath that I killed if it's David. If it's Moses, I looked at back at walking the children of Israel out of and seeing the plagues and seeing God work. I've seen God work and surely he will deliver you. Yeah, yeah. He says surely. Like he is sure it's not a hopeful, wishful prayer. But David or Moses is saying that to us today. Surely Jesus will deliver you. He is absolutely sure. The fowler, a definition for the fowler is a person maliciously uses deception to ensnare or trap others. Now, if that doesn't sound like the devil and the enemy, I don't know what's a greater definition of that. Surely he will deliver you from that. A person who lies in wait, roaring like a lion. He's not actually a lion. Pestilence is a contagious or infectious epidemic oh. <laughs> or disease. Wow. Are we not living in a time where there is disease around? Yeah. Not true. The Psalms 91 says Jesus, God will deliver you from that. And we have a choice today. We can believe in our faith. We can believe in what God says or you can believe fear and, and live in angst and live in frustration and go with your feelings. Because feelings will let you down no matter what you look at, no matter where you go, your feelings will let you down. You can claim that. You can pray that over your family. You can believe that for your life. You don't have to, but you can. Another portion of Scripture says all of God's promises are yes and amen. Yeah. These promises are yes for you. You can claim them for your life. God says these things. It's in His Word. Moses and David are proclaiming this over their life and over the people that they govern at that time. And he's saying that to us today. You don't have to live in fear. Verse 4. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. Now, guys, that's a little girly. I'll totally get that. We'll get to the guys in a second. The girls, this is for you. God's heart. This shows a great picture of God's heart of protection. You look at a, 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 a mommy bird or a, a, an eagle, a mommy eagle, how well they take care of their babies. Recently, we had a storm, right? It was windy. It was a couple weeks ago. Really, 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 really windy. You guys remember that? I'm talking about? Yeah. I don't remember the date. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate you. <laughs> you feel good. Thank you. So it was pretty, it was pretty scary out of, out, of, out of our place. Our neighbors had some um, like gazebo things blowing off their dock. I mean, it was... It was, it was nuts. And when it gets really scary out there, my little kids at 7 and 4, you saw them up here, they can get a little bit nervous. And they can come and they can come in our bed and, and cuddle with us. If there's big thunder that they don't know what that was, they can come and they can cuddle with us in our bed and we can kind of put our arms around them and protect them. And then in that moment, they know I'm safe. Amen. They may hear the storm. They may feel the wind. But they're with us, and they calm down immediately because they trust us as parents. They trust us. And hopefully your kids are the same way with you. And we can be the same way with God. His feathers and his wings protect us. There's a story of a, a painting competition where a bunch of these artists were challenged to make the best depiction of peace. There was multiple amazing artists. And Many, many amazing paintings of like serene sunsets and beautiful night skies and, and beaches that I want to be at and not here. I don't want to go to Arizona with. I just missed your name, by the way. Sharon. Jeez. Um, <laughs> that's horrible. Um, like these amazing pictures. But the one that won was crazy. Windstorm, snow, sleet, hail, it was nuts. But in the bottom corner of it, there was some there was a mommy eagle covering their baby eaglets that were fast asleep and restful and peaceful. Because that's a true depiction of peace. Yeah. Yeah. Being able to be calm and trusting in the middle yeah. of the storm. Yeah. 
That's the picture the psalmist is writing for us here. That Jesus is your protector. Now we can, by choice, step outside of the net. And we've all done that at times. Step outside of the net. Step outside of the wings. But we can choose to sit underneath the most high God. We don't have to work for it or earn it. All we got to do is step into it. Okay, that don't hear me wrong. That you have to abide by a certain amount of rules in order to get this from Jesus. That's not what he says. The eagles don't have to do that. They're just there because it's their home. Your home is with Jesus. We choose to leave or go sometimes. And Jesus is always with us. His word says he will never leave us nor forsake us. So in the middle of this storm, Jesus even models that throughout all the New Testament. He sees a storm and he's sleeping. Like in the middle of the storm, I'm not sleeping. I'm worried about my roof and I'm worried about my seats and I'm worried about my house. I'm not sleeping. But Jesus, so confident because he's God, that's <laughs> probably a good thing. And he is so calm and he's so peaceful. So he's asleep in the boat while the disciples are freaking out. He comes upstairs and he's groggy eyed. You know, he's rubbing his boogers out of his eyes and he's like, guys, guys, where's your faith? Calms the storm. He does that for us in our life. Yeah. Whatever you're facing, whatever upheaval, whatever angst or frustration or worry is going on in your life, Jesus looks at it and says, it's okay, I got this. It's okay. Bodie and Lexi might be really scared of that storm. But when they're in mom and dad's room and they're huddled up with mom and dad, they're safe. And they know it. And they immediately calm down. So the second part of verse 4 is for us, guys. His truth shall be your shield yeah. and buckler. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go Hawks. Yeah. Woo! His, his truth shall be your shield and your buckler. So a shield, in this case, is something that you dig into the ground, and it's big, and you're able to hide behind it. And a buckler is a smaller shield meant for up-close battle. So whatever battle you're fighting, whether it be small, whether it be big, God's our protector. Amen. And his shield will protect us. Ephesians 6 and 16, so we read a little part of that a little bit earlier. But Ephesians 6 and 16, it says, above all, it says, above all, this is Paul talking to the church at Ephesus, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So above all, why does he say, it's interesting to me, why does he say, above all, take your shield of faith? I believe because the devil wants to get in and around our shield and get us to doubt God's word, get us to question what God said, because we look at other people, well, it didn't work for them, or it hasn't worked in my life because of the way I thought it should have worked. Listen, if God gave you everything you wanted, you'd be a mess. God gave Angie and I everything we wanted, we'd be a mess. So sometimes I pray and ask for things, and God says no for reasons, because I'm so thankful. And he will in the future, too, because God knows more. But the devil wants you to doubt what he said in your sword, right? You talked about that in, in the Bible. He wants you to doubt that, and he wants to get you, mostly, I think, looking at other people. But they got sick. They whatever, they, it didn't work for them, and we don't know other people's situations, and I don't have an answer for everything. Okay, I'm just going to say that right now. I don't have an answer for why things happen the way that they happen all the time. First of all, I don't understand all of God's ways. His ways are higher than mine, and if I did understand them, then I, I don't, that's too much pressure. <laughs> I don't understand God's ways, but I am always going to trust in what I believe the Bible says, in, in, that he wants good for me, that he loves me, that he's on my side, that he is in this battle with me and for me, and that Psalms 91, I can claim for my life that he's going to take, he's my shield. He's taking on the battle for me. I'm trusting in who he is. I'm not looking at the world. I'm not looking at my doubts or my feelings. I'm looking to the word of God and I'm standing on that because we walk by faith, not by sight. So 2 Corinthians says, walking by faith and not by sight is really something easy to say and it's a really good churchy term. So if you come to church and you don't know what to say, talk about walking by faith and not by sight, people will cheer you on. <laughs> You're fitting good. <laughs> but it's a lot harder to live by. 
I just look back at Angie and I's journey over the last 13 or 16 years we've been married. And we look at our journey and how this has always been our dream to be able to pastor a church and do everything with the recovery ministry and a men's discipleship and, and everything that, and women's discipleship, sorry, I'm not singling you out, ladies, for sure. But we, we've had these dreams, but our journey has been so up and so down. And there are many times I wanted to bail on the dream. I wanted to bail because it just, it just didn't look like it was going to happen. And it was so hard to walk by faith, not by what we saw. And I'm working at a job that looks like it's dead end. And I don't, I, don't, I don't know why I'm here working at selling nuts and bolts. I don't even know what nuts and bolts are. And I'm trying to sell them to people. <laughs> like, I don't even have a clue. I'm driving a FedEx truck, and I'm not a great driver. Like, why am I in these jobs that I... It's really hard in those moments where it doesn't seem right to live by faith and not by sight. But God asks us to walk by faith because then everything we do is hinged on Him and not on us. Amen. And I'm so thankful for that because if everything was hinged on me, I would be dead. I'd be a wreck because if everything's hinged on me, it all goes south. But if everything is hinged on Jesus, man, He's perfect. He's been perfect. He paid the price for me. If I can walk directly with Him. Why does the devil say, above all, your shield of faith? Or why, why does, because the devil wants to come in around your shield. So above all, Paul says, your shield of faith, or your buckler. Who calls it a buckler these days? <laughs> Old school, man. King James Version. <laughs> Live behind the shield of faith and not in how you feel. So how do you build your faith? In Romans 10, 17, it says, faith comes by hearing hearing the Word of God, listening to encouraging things, not selling in or buying into your fear, but buying in to your faith. Verse 5 and 6, Psalms 91. You shall not be afraid of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Man, I, I love how specific the psalmist is. He lays up everything I think that we could ever encounter or ever feel. He says, you got lots of fear? Okay, I'm going to list all your fears out. I'm going to read your mail. I'm going to say it all out. I'm going to say, hey, still choose faith. Amen. Because Jesus is the reason for all of that. And Jesus is the answer to all of that. So choose faith, not fear. So when life gets tough, when life gets hard, like what, what do we do? When we feel fear... What do we do? So you have your Bible. Open to the uh, book of Judges for me. Because I think this is a good portion of Scripture and a good story to relate what the psalmist is writing in Psalms 91. I mean, he covers everything that, that we don't know. We're going to look at Gideon in the book of Judges. And Gideon faces a whole lot of things that he doesn't have answers for. So he's coming up against a group of people called the Midianites. And the Midianites are horrible people. So they're stealing everything away from Gideon and his family. It's a really, really bad state that he's in. They, they would, um, Gideon's people would work for things, and the Midians would just come and take them. So Gideon is living and hiding. He's running from a very, very fearful people. So they've come out of the land of Egypt. They've gone through all the plagues and stuff like that. They've kind of lived in the promised land for a while, and they're out of the promised land now. And life has happened, and the Midianites have taken over. And so Gideon is in this horrible spot. So in Judges chapter 6, verse 11, it says, Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. He said, I'm not going to let them have this. And he's living in fear. He's in hiding. So when God sees Gideon, he's in the middle of a wine press, hiding from everybody. The angel of the Lord, when it says that, it means Jesus, appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, or mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. Now, hold up. It doesn't really look like that. He's in the middle of a situation where he is... Um, just taken advantage of. It's horrible. Kind of like Joseph we talked about a couple weeks ago. Just in the middle of the muck. Life is horrible. It doesn't look good. I'm sure Gideon doesn't feel well. He doesn't feel like Jesus is his protector. Excuse me. God is his protector at that time. So he's hiding away. And God says to him, hey, mighty man of valor. Hey, strong guy. He's got to be saying, man, 
I'm hiding in the middle of nowhere. Like, I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm so weak and feeble, and this is just, like, are you seeing this, God? Are you seeing this? Verse 13. Sir. I like how Gideon responds to God. Sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And why are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Where are all the miracles? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. So he's calling it like it is. God, this does not feel very good. I am far away. I'm hiding because I just need to keep what I've got. I'm trying to not die in the middle of this. But God doesn't act on our feelings. God sees potential in us when we don't see potential Amen. in us. In the middle of the worst spot, he calls him a mighty man of valor. Do we, do, do, do we sometimes, when God even comes and tells us, hey, you're a mighty man of valor, do we doubt it? Do we look at our financial capabilities? Do we look at our abilities? Do we look at us being still stuck in this addiction? Do we still look at, do we complain about it? In the middle of understanding even God's promises, do we complain about where we're at? And do we doubt what God says? Verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites I am sending you. Verse 15. But Lord, this is Gideon, right? We didn't call him sir there. But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan, the family, is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. I don't feel very strong. I don't feel like I can handle what's coming up. I don't feel like I can beat this addiction on my own. I don't feel like I can meet the requirements that I need to meet to get the house that I need to get, that I want to get. I don't feel like I'm the good enough quality to be the spouse that I'm supposed to be. What do you doubt about you? You ever feel like that? You ever question, God, why do you, what, what are you saying? Because he says, I know my thoughts are good for you. He says, you are a mighty man of God. You are more than a conqueror. I don't feel more than a conqueror. And in verse 16, the Lord says to him, I will be with you. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. And the story goes on and he whittles down the army so it can be proven that it's not Gideon and his men. It's God fighting for them. They go and they defeat the Midianites because God is with him. But yet, yeah, I love Gideon. If you go on and you continue to read his story, Gideon still continues to ask questions. He still continues to say, God, I don't, I don't think this is possible. I don't think this is possible. In this same chapter, he's still doubting and he's feeling. And in verse 24, he says, Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it, The Lord is Peace. <laughs> he named it Peace. So he builds an altar to God and says, okay, God, this is peace. I'm going to trust in you and I'm going to live in your peace. Although, throughout the rest of the story, he falters a little bit. And he asks questions and he's like, God, I need you to prove this to me. I need you to show this to me. So he's a real person. But yet, in this moment, he calls God, I'm going to call you peace. And I'm going to trust in you. And we can choose faith over how we feel. John 14, 27 Jesus says to his disciples, peace I leave with you. Peace I leave with you. And I think sometimes we begin to question the peace of God. We begin to question the faith that we can have in God because we look at us. And so we begin to be scared because I don't deserve to be protected like that. I don't deserve to have a blessed family. I don't deserve to have whatever it is. Because we doubt our performance. 1 John 4, 18 and 19 says this. says, perfect love casts out all fear. Jesus was perfect for us. So we don't have to be. Look, you don't have to look at yourself anymore. Because it's not about you. It's about what Jesus did on the cross for you. If you come to church or you... Come to God in prayer at, at your house or in your car or whatever it is. And you begin to feel guilt. And you begin to feel shame. And you begin to feel heavy. That's not God. That's the devil trying to convince you that you're not worthy. Hey, you're not worthy. 
Jesus was worthy for you, so Amen. now you are. Yes. Amen. We don't have to look to ourselves. If you feel up and down because one day was good because you had your quiet time and the next day wasn't because you didn't, that's not the way God operates. He sent his son to be perfect on us. You're not ever going to be perfect. Jesus already was perfect, so because of that, you are perfect. Amen. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see you. He doesn't see your faults. He doesn't see your failures. He doesn't see your shortcomings. He sees his son that paid a price to forgive you of everything we've ever done or ever will do. And we can live in that. That's called being righteous. And God calls us righteous because of Jesus. We don't have to live in fear. But we can live in our faith because of what Jesus did on the cross. Can you bow your heads with me really quick? I don't know what you're doing.